Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful to be your children, to have your word, to have the Holy Spirit indwelling, sealing, comforting, leading us in sanctification, conforming us to the image of your Son, guaranteeing our arrival at our final destination. Lord, we thank you for the Psalms and for these poems, these lyrics that resonate with our hearts. We pray even tonight that we would get courage from the truth of your word, even as we look again to the songbook of Israel. We ask for your help in this by your Holy Spirit. Uh, Would you lead us in your truth and make our hearts pliable and soft before you? In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 10. As we make our way through the Psalms week by week on Sunday nights, we are here at what is really the second part of a Psalm we looked at last week. It is likely that Psalm 9 and 10 go together. Uh, There is no ascription at the top of Psalm 10, and it picks up in the alphabet where Psalm 9 left off. And as we talked about last week, Psalm 9 and 10 deal with a similar theme. There is injustice in the world. And Psalm 9 was rather hopeful. Psalm 10 really is somewhat perplexing, or at least it is David's expression of being perplexed. But I think as we look at this tonight, we are going to have a window into some things that are encouraging for us. And of course, it ends on a high note, as many of the Psalms do, even though they start in the trouble. Let's read together Psalm 10. Why do you stand afar off, O Yahweh? Why do you hide yourself in times of distress? In his lofty pride, the wicked hotly pursues the afflicted. Let them be caught in the thoughts which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his soul's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns Yahweh. The wicked, in the haughtiness of his countenance, does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all of his adversaries, he snorts at them. He says in his heart, I will not be shaken. From generation to generation, I will not be in adversity. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He sits in the places of the villages where one lies in wait. In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lies in waiting in a hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lies in wait to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. He crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Yahweh. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He has said in his heart, you will not require it. You have seen it, for you have beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. The unfortunate commits himself to you, and you have been the helper of the orphan. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. Yahweh is king forever and ever. Nations has, have perished from his land. O Yahweh, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will cause your ear to give heed, to give justice to the orphan and the oppressed, so that the man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. We live in a day of increasing criminality, increasing violence, Crimes that go unpunished, and as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 8.11, when the sentence is not executed quickly against an evil deed, the hearts of the sons of men are given more fully to commit evil. We see that in our day. Crimes going unpunished and incentivizing further crime. We don't know any of the particulars of the historical setting of this psalm, but generally speaking, David wrote in a time 
that was rife with criminal violence. You may think that San Francisco is bad and Chaz Chop in Seattle, an ungoverned square in the middle of town is bad. But in the ancient Near East, the world was filled with violence. Roving bandits and roving armies would raid and plunder various towns and villages, hauling off people and possessions. In order to defend yourself against such things, you had to band together with others. And really, might was right. Whoever was strongest could do what he wanted. If we're to follow the template of this psalm, and think about what it is like to live in a world of, of criminality unpunished, of injustices not made right. What ought we to do? David here gives us four responses for when you encounter injustices in this world. And we will just follow David's heart through this psalm. David's first response found in verse 1 is, Just simply to lament the apparent absence of God. This begins a pathway down perplexity. It it is essentially the question, oh God, where are you? Look at verse 1. Why do you stand afar off, O Yahweh? Why do you hide yourself in times of distress? Now, what does our theology tell us about a question like this? this? This is an emotional question. It is a situationally grounded question. It certainly avoids the reality that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. And he is everywhere all the time. And he is everywhere all the time as king. And he is strong. David will, of course, affirm this at the end of the song. But you may resonate with the question. Where is God when things are bad? Why does it feel like He is absent. We will call this the apparent absence of God. And God is not physically, visibly manifest on the earth. When he will be that, he will reign. Christ will be on the earth in Jerusalem, ruling the nations with the rod of iron. God's kingly sovereignty now is an invisible one. He is sovereign over every detail of the universe, but he does so not in a manifest reign. In fact, the manifest rule of God's kingdom in David's day was David. It was the man that God had put on the throne in order to be the sub-regent under God's regal authority for the nation set apart as his people in the world. It is not everything that God's kingly rule will be. And David was a witness to bad people doing whatever they wanted with no accountability. And so he asked the question, God, why do you seem to be absent when things go bad? Let's follow David's train of thought. Secondly, can contemplate the nefarious motives of the wicked. Really, this is the bulk of the psalm, verses 2 through 11. We'll, we'll look through this piece by piece. And this may seem counterintuitive, but I think we can take some comfort in unpacking the nefarious motives of those who do evil. We're going to see why they do what they do. We're going to open the hood and and discover what is driving the injustices. We had a boat in Tennessee and, and it made a certain low rumbling noise at idle and a, a, a good... Tennessee citizen walked up to the dock to me one day and said, boy, what's she got in that thing? Is that a 454? Yes, indeed. It was a 454, 454 cubic inches with a four barrel carburetor. And it made noise. It rumbled. He wanted to know what was driving this thing. He wanted to know what was on the inside. He knew his motors. He knew it by the sound. And what we're going to do this evening is pop open the hood of the criminal activity of the wicked in our world. And we're going to ask, what is driving them? And it might seem something of a a dark tale to wander through the motives of unchecked criminality. But I think there is going to be sort of a sideways encouragement in this. 
It certainly is not encouragement to look through the, the details of why bad people do bad things. But, but if we understand that criminality in our world and injustices in our world are not just a random happenstance, but they are in fact motivated by a life not yielded in faith to God, a life not lived according to God's plan, a life that has in fact gone down the alternate path from obedience to a path of disobedience. And what's tremendously comforting about that, when we strip away the veneer, that guy is really successful. He seems to always get what he wants. Maybe he's blessed. We open the hood, we see what's really driving this thing, and we understand where it's headed. Because if, if what is driving an apparently successful but unjust life are a series of motives that God sees and God is provoked by and God will judge, then that gives great comfort to those who are afflicted under them. It just means that in the end, God wins. And you know this general principle about life. There, uh, there is one pathway that, hey, that looks like a smooth path. That looks like easy going. That looks like prosperity and comfort and ease and, and everything I'd really like to have. I get to worship myself and go down that path. And you know that it might look easy at the front end, but it gets increasingly difficult as it goes. A series of vanities emptying them out into more vanities, leading to despair and ultimate judgment. That life never satisfies. And there's another path that looks hard at the front end. It is called take up your cross and follow Jesus. It doesn't look like a primrose path. It doesn't look smooth and easy. It doesn't advertise as a path of comfort and prosperity. It actually looks like a pathway of adversity. Of fighting sin on the outside and trusting God through difficulties. Of fighting sin on the inside and trusting God through difficulties on the outside. It's not an easy path. And yet you and I both know that a life ordered under God's ways is actually a better path. Things go better for you on the path of obedience than they do on the path of disobedience. But looks can be deceiving. So in these Next series of verses, really the, the center bulk of this psalm, we're going to look under the hood, see what's driving the life of the wicked. You and I may be tempted to envy, we may be tempted to fear, we may be tempted to despair, until we see what's operating the system. Then we begin to understand their miserable state. And we might even begin to fear for their eventual eternal future. Man looks on appearances. God sees the heart. And when we combine this largest section of the psalm with the end of the psalm, when we see their activities the way God sees them, we will recognize that those who commit injustices in this world and seem to be getting away with it, we will recognize that they are in fact seen their inner workings are laid bare before him with whom we have to do. And they will answer for every deed. So this may seem toilsome and unpleasant. But let's contemplate the nefarious motives of the wicked. First in verse 2, consequential pride. What is driving the unjust wicked in our world? Consequential pride. Look at verse 2. In his lofty pride, the wicked hotly pursues the afflicted. Let them be caught in their own devices. This pride has consequences. Notice they are lifted up. And, and in their haughty pride, they are pursuing the afflicted. They are an aggressor and an oppressor. We find out later in the psalm, it is the, it is the poor and the orphan that are afflicted by these unjust power brokers. And this pride has consequences. Notice what David prays here. Let them be caught in the thoughts which they have devised. Uh, let them roll a stone and be crushed in it. Let them dig a pit and fall into it, essentially. 
Let there be the, the natural consequences for meddling with evil things. You, you recognize that the, the criminal underworld does not promise a long lifespan. Usually those engaged in wicked deeds over and over and over again get caught up in the very consequences of their wickedness. You may remember that Haman hung on his own gallows. That the enemies who wanted Daniel thrown into the den of lions were themselves devoured by the lions. Another motivator here is in verse 3. It is misplaced worship. The Legacy Standard Bible reads, For the wicked boasts of his soul's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns Yahweh. It kind of gives three statements there. There's another way to read this Hebrew text, and, and I'll just give you my very rough translation. The wicked praises himself. He cuts off by violence his soul's desire. He kneels to himself. And he spurns Yahweh. And I, I think a, a very legitimate way to read this text is to see the himself as the direct object of two of these verbs. And you end up with four statements. He praises himself. He boasts himself. And then whatever he wants, he just gets it by violence. He literally cuts it off by violence. Whatever his soul desires. And then thirdly, he, he kneels. The, the word in the Legacy Standard Bible says he curses. Uh, but that word curse is just about always translated blesses. And, and I think sometimes the translators just didn't know what to do with, with he blesses. The, he, the, the bad guy is not blessing God. But I think the reality here is he's blessing himself. He kneels to himself. He bows to himself. It's a mirror of the first phrase. He praises himself. In the third phrase, he kneels to himself. And, and by doing all of this, he spurns Yahweh. He spurns Yahweh. He just stiff arms God. He says, I don't care what you think. And he has reversed worship. His fundamental task as a creature is to revere the creator. Instead, he makes himself the object of worship doesn't matter what it costs anybody else. He wants what he wants. He cuts it off by violence. He is like those described by Paul in Philippians 3.19. They glory in things that are shameful. And they worship their own appetites. It is the worship of self that says, I must get, I must get, I must get. I will take it from whomever I can take it from. And the result of this misplaced worship is that there is no restraint. Listen, if you are God, who can tell you what to do? If you bow at the altar of you, there is no higher court in the land. And so to displace God from the throne of the universe, to install self and the throne of the universe means to throw off restraints. I want what I want. I'll get it when I want it. Now, why is this comforting? Well, you recognize that the man who is acting unjustly and oppressing others and doing it motivated by abject selfishness that rises to the level of self-worship is such a, an offense to the one true God that, that you and I must actually tremble in fear at such a one, pray for such an enemy that God would have mercy and humble him before that one would meet his maker. It really is terrifying when you think about it. The third motivator is in verse 4. This is arrogant atheism. Arrogant atheism. The wicked, in the haughtiness of his countenance, does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. So, here is the wicked. And the English text, in the haughtiness of his countenance, is, is something literally like, his nose is to the heights. <laughs> He's just got his nose way up in the air. He's, he's above everything. He has made himself his own standard. And therefore, he does not seek God. What he decides is right. What he decides he wants is right. What he decides to do is the right. And notice at the end of verse 4, all his thoughts, his consuming worldview is, there is no God. 
atheism. Now, of course, this is a practical atheism. We know that every man knows that God exists externally by what's in creation and internally by the internal witness God has planted in every human heart. But what does mankind do with that knowledge? Some other explanation for the cosmos outside and suppress the truth of conscience and the knowledge of the existence of God on the inside. And he must do this. If he is to get away with this sort of living, he must remove all thought of a creator, sustainer, and judge. He, he can't have a God who made everything, who sustains everything, upon whom his very life is dependent, and he certainly can't go, have a God who is to judge all men at the end of time. So he has to conceive of God as not existing, or perhaps a God who is irrelevant or uninterested. Conceive of God as something other than he is. The fourth motivator is his undaunted success. Success has a way of endorsing bad behavior. That's true for him here. His ways prosper at all times. He, he always seems to succeed. And doesn't that sort of make us feel like we're blessed? Things are going well. I guess the universe is okay with me. Karma's on my side. Or, or maybe even God loves me. I'm doing good. You have to know that your earthly successes are not an endorsement of the condition of your heart. They may actually be a judgment. To have all of the world while rejecting God would bring about an eternity of judgment. That's not a good story. He is also motivated by blissful ignorance. Look at the second half uh, second line in verse 5. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. Simply saying there that for the wicked man, for the unjust man, God's judgments, God's assessments of right and wrong are too transcendent. They're way above. Can't even see them. Don't even care about them. His judgments are out of my sight. This is a blissful ignorance. It is a culpable ignorance. This is a, a man setting his conscience aside. This is a man retraining the way he thinks about right and wrong. This is a man suppressing the truth about God. It is appointed for every man to die once and then face judgment. He has removed these thoughts far from himself. And then on a horizontal level, we see another driver of this wickedness in the third line of verse 5. It is untouchable contempt. Untouchable contempt. Notice what he says. As for all his adversaries, he snorts at them. So at a horizontal level, what, whatever enemies this unjust man would have, he just exhales contemptuously, snorts, scoffs. He doesn't respect anyone. Any of his contenders or rivals or enemies are just mocked. And that leads to an incredible confidence in verse 6. He says in his heart, I will not be shaken from generation to generation. I will not be in adversity. The word incredible in English, you have a negation on the front and then credible. It used to mean not credible. <laughs> Not believable. This is an incredible confidence. He has a confidence, something, confidence in something he has no business being confident about. Look at the arrogance here. I will not be shaken. Oh, puny man. <laughs> I like natural disasters. I'm sure I don't like being in them. And we live in Arizona where we don't get them. And so I'm truly lacking sympathy for people who live in earthquake country, volcano country, hurricane country, tornado alley, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We just, we just kind of live here. But I'm fascinated by the power. The power of an avalanche. The power of an F5 tornado. 
These kinds of things that just make puny man sense his puniness. You witness any of these things, you see videos of these things, you read stories of people who survive or don't survive these things, and you recognize for anybody to utter a statement like, I will not be shaken, is an insanity. You can't control your circumstances. To whatever degree the the wicked oppressors are deceived that they are in control of their destiny is a farce. And it's a farce that is removed so easily by a whim in a natural disaster. This certainly is dislodged in final judgment. Notice the second half of verse 6. He says, from generation to generation, I will not be in adversity. What? How does that sentence even make sense? Beyond my own generation, nothing will ever go wrong. After I'm dead, I'll still be living high. (laughs) This is an arrogant boast. It is like the one who said... And Jesus described the man as, okay, I have barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. And Jesus said, you fool, tonight your soul is required. You're not the captain of your ship. The the master of your destiny. John Calvin said, there are two kinds of people. There are those who despise God and assume everything will turn out fine. They will always prosper and then, this is my description, they, they are in the row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. They're, they're just cruising. And then Calvin describes the godly who live life differently. They, they live by a thread. That is, they know they live by a thread. Every man actually does, but the godly recognizes it. They know they could die at any time. And yet, what does the godly do? The godly sails a tempestuous sea, Calvin says, but endures the storms patiently because he is totally dependent on the grace of God. So the wicked prosperous look like it's smooth sailing and everything's going great. Everything's always going to be great. Look at me. I'm in charge. And the godly says, "Ah, this is a rough sea, but God's grace. There is in verse 7, driving this injustice, irreverent conversation. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. The way a man talks reveals the heart. A man irreverent towards God and cruel towards men faces a terrible end to his days. No matter how lovely his path looks at the moment. I'd be out in public with my dad. Uh, We'd be standing next to somebody with a potty mouth. (laughs) And my dad would just always barge into the conversation and say, does your mom know you talk like that? (laughs) Somehow he made it funny and it ended up in a good conversation. I I never, never saw him get beat up for that. But the way a man talks reveals the heart. And what can you know about those with a a salty tongue and a a cruel bite to everything they say? The ones who are wickedly sarcastic in every conversation. Their task is to tear down rather than build up in all that they do. Just know that the end of that life is a meeting with God who will hold him to account for every careless word. You can't curse God. You can't go on cursing men and never be addressed by the maker of the tongue. There is displayed in verses 8 to 10 predatory malice. This is a a graphic depiction of the kind of selfish violence that often seems like random, senseless violence in our culture. And will increase with increasing criminality and a decrease of punishment for criminality. Listen to this description. He sits in the places of the village where one lies in wait. In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. Not a rival gang member. 
Not a, not a drug deal gone bad, but somebody who was minding their own business, just walking down the street. And this wicked one is lurking in the corner, in the dark places, in the hiding places, and, and springs out and just kills someone. So senseless, so violent. Look at verse 8. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. It's like this one is depicted as picking out innocent people on purpose. Just whoever he can beat up, whoever he can prey upon. Using stealth and strategy to fight a battle with somebody who's not even fighting. Verse 9, he lies in wait in a hiding place as a lion in his lair, lying in wait to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. There, There is planning and strategizing and lurking and crouching and pouncing like a predatory animal, like a cat playing with a toy. Verse 10, he crouches, he bows down. That is, he's, he's getting low. And the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. Mighty ones, probably a, a reference to large teeth on a saber-toothed tiger. Or the claws on a predatory big cat. Whatever he has at his disposal are, are his implements for bringing down the unfortunate. This predatory malice marks the unjust, wicked. And God sees it all. Look at verse 11. We come to a suicidal presumption in the wicked. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He'll never see it. It is a danger, a suicidal presumption To say God doesn't see when God sees everything. To assume God doesn't hear when God not only hears every word that you say, but every thought as you think it before it comes out the mouth. God is everywhere. He sees everything. And this is a comfort to us. When we observe injustices in our world, we might be given to envy or fear or despair. Until we see what drives them. We pop open the hood. Uh, we look at the engine. What, what, what is driving this kind of life? And we recognize all over again that God sees every bit of it. We begin to understand that, that theirs is a miserable life, not an enviable life. And that life has a miserable end, not an enviable end. And we might actually begin to fear for their eternal future. We need to see the activities the way God sees them. It's not just powerful people get stuff. Oh man, I wish. No, but see what it is that is driving them. And recognize that God will take care of things. If we're following David's template here, as we think about the perplexities of living in an unjust world, we lament the apparent absence of God, we contemplate the nefarious motives of the wicked, and thirdly, we make earnest appeal to Yahweh. Look at verse 12. Arise, O Yahweh. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He has said in his heart, you will not require it. You have seen it, for you have beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. The unfortunate commits himself to you, and you have been the helper of the orphan. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The humble remember that Yahweh remembers. The humble remember that Yahweh remembers. It's interesting. The wicked forgets God. The humble remember that Yahweh remembers. And Yahweh remembers the humble. He doesn't forget the afflicted. He doesn't forget the oppressed. He sees every evil deed. And so his people come. And they pray. And this prayer. 
The same way that the first half of the song ended, Psalm 919 says, Arise, O Yahweh, don't let man prevail. In verse 12 of this psalm, Arise, O Yahweh, O God, lift up your hand. This is a request for the presence of God, for the manifest presence. It seems like you've been absent, but all it will take for you to set things right is for you to rise up. You've been here, you've seen it. To rise up, this request would mean to manifest your presence. And to acknowledge God as king all the time, sovereign over every detail. But then to ask him to act is to make a plea for God to exercise his sovereignty on behalf of his people. Rise up, the psalmist says. And then the second part of verse 12, lift up your hand. The hand and the arm were signs of strength. To ask God to lift up his hand is to ask him to show his strength, to act with strength on behalf of his people. And then he says, don't forget. That is, remember your people. God remembers. God asks us to pray. The humble come to him and praise the very things that God will do. And so David requests the presence of God in verse 12. And then in verse 13, rehearses his burdens before God. You and I can follow suit and rehearse our burdens before God. Look at verse 13. Why has the wicked spurned God? He has said in his heart, you will not require it. Reflecting back on that which drives the wicked. They act as if God doesn't see, as if God doesn't care, as if he won't hold them to account. Oh God, they have spurned you. And you see the vertical nature of David acknowledging what this injustice is. We feel the injustice on a horizontal level. Here, David points it out at the vertical level. Oh God, when they have oppressed the orphan, when they've lied in wait for the innocent to kill them and to take their stuff, they have been spurning you. That's a good perspective. In verse 13, he says, uh, he said in his heart, you will not require it. Taking this before the Lord is, is something of a burden. Did you hear what he said, O oh God? <laughs> Just lays it before the Lord. And then reaffirm your confidence in God. If we're to follow David, that's what he does here. David reaffirms his confidence in God in verse 14. He says, you have seen it. You have beheld the mischief and the vexation in order to take it into your hand. Listen, the oppressed and the innocent have been at the mercy of the wicked and the unjust. They've been in the hands of the evil ones. But as soon as God takes the evil ones into his hand, all things wrong are made right. David knows that God sees all wrongs. He will take matters into his own hands. And David is praying to God because he could derive no advantage making his appeal to man. David didn't have a way to solve all injustices in the world. And think about this, in the glory days of Israel, when David was king and his son Solomon were, was king, and, and these were called the, the golden age of Israel, when Israel was truly the sitting superpower of the ancient Near East. All the surrounding nations were bringing tribute to Israel. All the enemies were at peace and subdued. Even then, when, when David and his son were sitting on top, they, they could not solve all the injustices of the world. You read the book of Ecclesiastes, and this is Solomon in the golden era talking about injustices in his own land. Wait, aren't you the king? Couldn't you put a stop to that? There is a recognition that only God can finalize these things. And so David prays. It's the right appeal. This psalm has taught us to lament the apparent absence of God in the faces of injustices. To contemplate the nefarious motives of the wicked. And thirdly, to make an earnest appeal to Yahweh. And then fourthly, finally this evening, to recall the glorious destiny of the world. To recall the glorious destiny of the world. And, and this is where the psalm ends, where the world ends. 
This is prayer and prophecy simultaneously. This is eschatology. Notice what he says. Yahweh is king forever and ever. Nations have perished from his land. You, you go to this present reality that is always true. Yahweh is always king. This has always been true. Even when there's been no manifest kingdom on the earth, Yahweh has always been king. Yahweh was king before there was a universe. He was king over creation before the fall. He was king on the day humanity fell. He has been king ever since. He has mediated his kingly rule through humans, through Adam in the garden. He successively worked his kingly role through mediators, through mankind, through patriarchs and judges, and then the kings of Israel. In all of that, Yahweh has always been king forever and ever, backwards and forwards, Yahweh is king. And notice David looking back as proof of the fact that Yahweh is king, even in a mediatorial kingdom, nations have perished from his land. Even when God's kingly rule was not manifest by his special presence on the earth, he was still in charge. And in the times of the conquest and in David's era, you see kings fall and nations fall before God's promised people. David's able to look back in his own history, in his own time, and see that God's kingly rule have caused nations to perish. Nations that had provoked God's anger. Nations that lived by a code of injustice and oppression and evil. In verse 17 David says, Yahweh, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will cause your ear to give heed. God will always be king, verse 16. He will answer the prayers of his people, verse 17. This is an expression of confidence looking to the future. You have heard the desire. You will strengthen their heart. And you will cause your ear to give heed. Literally, your, your ear will give heed to us. God answers the prayers of his people. And then verse 18, God will right every wrong. God will right every wrong. To give justice to the orphan and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. Future realities. And you could just put in the margin of your Bible, when... When will there be no more oppression of the orphan? When will there be no more mistreatment of the oppressed? And when will the earthy man no longer cause terror? That day's coming. You can bank on that promise from God. He will make everything right. He will right every wrong. He will end all oppressions. And his reign, by which he has been king forever and ever, will be manifest among his people and no evil will dwell. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you belong to the king. You have to recognize that you have been a victim of oppression and injustice while you've walked God's earth, but you must also realize you've been a perpetrator of those things. Have there been unkind words in your mouth and Curses towards God and men. Have you taken things that didn't belong to you? Have you acted out in anger and even violence and taken from the innocent? Have you schemed and plotted against others? Listen, we do those things from the womb. If you've been sitting here thinking, no, I've never done any of those things. We'll go interview your siblings after the service. These things come natural to the human condition. And you and I actually must be rescued not only from injustices perpetrated against us, but from the injustices perpetrated by us. And of course, the only way to do that is to belong to Jesus Christ. The king of all kings who took on flesh, became a man, went to a cross and died in the place of sinners so that the victims and perpetrators of injustices could be declared just forever and for all time by the grace of God. Jesus dies as a substitute on the cross to pay for our sins. 
To belong to him means to belong to his kingdom. To belong to him means to be a citizen of an era that never ends, that will never experience injustice again. And we long for that day. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come quickly. We pray that you would reign and rule manifestly on the earth. Your kingdom would come. Your will will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And we pray in the meantime that we would wait well under the perplexing injustices of this world. I pray that we would see the, the wickedness for what it is. Not an enviable primrose path. But a way that seems right to a man but ends in death. And we pray that we would have comfort and joy from you in this pilgrimage. We ask it in Jesus name. Amen.